please welcome her to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, Brenda Trenodon. Thank you very much, Ollie, and um, and thank you to Joe Santanon for uh, for asking me to come today. Um, Joe has been involved, I think, since the very beginning of the Thirty Percent Club as as a founder member, and um, and certainly has has been working very hard alongside many of us um, since 2010. Um, so first of all, um, I want to say that it's really refreshing to be talking to an audience that's made up of relatively young new businesses that don't have all the legacy issues that, um, that come from the long established companies, including bias systems and processes, embedded masculine cultures, and, and you know, you've all got an easier opportunity to really deliver on diversity and, and innovation that a lot of these large listed behemoths are really struggling with. Um, many of the FTSE 100 CEOs and chairs really do want to improve gender balance they want to make their organizations truly inclusive, improve the culture, but they've got long ingrained cultures and they've got what we often call that permafrost, middle level, that's really, really difficult to shift. And I like to say um, it's a multivariate problem with a multivariate solution and often a multi-year solution. But, um, but that's not something that I think most of you have to contend with. Um, so, so let's talk. First of all, I don't think I have to probably tell you um, in the room that there is a growing body, actually a mountain um, of research and evidence that supports the argument that more diverse boards and management teams are much more effective than identical teams in terms of delivering better decision making and that increased diversity at board level and in senior management helps improve financial performance. Um, Credit Suisse has done work on this and, and many others. Research from McKinsey shows that European companies that are in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have financial returns above their peers. Um, research done by Bain in 2017 um, showed that most diverse companies, the ones that are the most diverse, are also the most innovative. And the most innovative companies are also the most diverse. And interestingly, what they found was that um, you needed to have at least 20% women in senior leadership to um, have an impact on innovation revenues. And who doesn't want to be more innovative? Um, I think it's, it's also pretty obvious that in an environment where there's an increasing war for talent, um, companies need to cast their nets as widely as possible. Furthermore, studies by Catalyst show that companies with more women in senior management have lower staff turnover, they have better employee engagement scores, and their cultures are more inclusive and therefore better for everyone. And as Peter Drucker famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast any day. So finally, um, I think we also know that companies need to ensure that they're more reflective of their customers, their wider workforce, and society in general. <laughs> And this is something that investors are really looking at now as well under the ESG um, heading. And so as the 30% Club, we have been trying to point these arguments out to anybody who would listen um, since, uh, since the end of, of 2010, um, and particularly the chairs and CEOs of the FTSE 350 companies. And the 65 CEOs that we count now and 43 chairs who've signed up here in the UK they all believe um, that this 30% target, and, and 30, by the way, is the minimum. It's not the end game, of course. We want to get to 50%, but 30 is what we feel is, is the, the minimum that we need to have. They all feel that the only way to have long-term sustainable change is through women and men working together to achieve this because it makes good business sense, not because it's, it's what's right. Um, we very much talk to them about the business case. Um, I hold monthly breakfasts with FTSE 100 CEOs and chairs, usually three to five, and we talk about gender diversity and inclusive cultures. And you know, most are very engaged on it because they do feel it's good for their business. But they're all getting frustrated because they feel the change isn't happening fast enough. And they all want to know what's the silver bullet. You know, of course, these are business leaders, they're impatient, 
you know, when, when they sign up, they say, come and have a meeting afterwards. So I go and meet them, and then I think they think I'm going to tell them the secret then. Okay, now that I'm signed up, what's the one thing I can do? How can I change things in instantly? Um, how do I get a smaller pay gap? You know, because that's the big thing everyone's looking at. And so, you know, I say to them, just like there isn't one treatment for a serious disease or, or for cancer, you know, th there's no silver bullet in terms of solving your gender pay gap problem. You know, everyone's different, everyone's health is different, and, you know, just the same way every organization is different in organizational health and problems. Um, but I think it is fair to say that no matter what type of serious illness you have, um, being fit and healthy as possible and having a positive mental attitude will improve your chances of having a good outcome from your treatment. And similarly, for companies, having a good and inclusive culture is critical to the success of your diversity initiatives and ultimately to the success of your organization. So let's talk a little bit about culture. Organizational culture is usually defined as the underlying beliefs, the assumptions, the values, and the ways of interacting that contribute to the social and psychological environment of your organization. But more simply put, employees usually say it's the way things get done around here. That's what culture is. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. But unfortunately, often the things that we repeatedly do aren't necessarily positive, like hiring or promoting in our own likeness, building networks through sporting events or at the pub after work, or encouraging winning at all costs. Clearly, organizations are complex, and there are many subcultures. But usually, there are a few that run throughout. Just like in large families, all family members don't look the same, but there are often family traits that run throughout families, like high cheekbones or red hair. Um, leaders really need to understand what those family traits are within their organizations. They then need to choose a few of the positive ones to really emphasize and communicate and role model, and the negative ones should be actively discouraged. Personally, I think that a shared sense of purpose and a sense of belonging are the two things that can really create a competitive culture. And they're a real advantage in terms of, of overall organizational culture. People want to go to work feeling that what they're doing is meaningful and that they're actually contributing to the overall organizational goals. They want to know that they're making a contribution and that, that they have an emotional connection to the firm they want that sense of belonging and they want to know that they're part of the team. And this is human nature. Research has shown that improving the sense of belonging in underrepresented groups reduces stress levels, improves physical health, emotional well being, and performance. It creates a truly inclusive culture where everyone can be themselves and truly thrive. So, how can companies do this? Surely every company would like to have employees who come to work with a strong sense of purpose and who feel a deep emotional connection to the firm. Of course, it has to start at the top. The CEO has to have a strong sense of the culture that he or she wants to promote. They have to have a vision for the organization. They must be clear on how the culture links to the strategic objectives, and they then need to communicate it. They need to communicate it authentically. People have to believe them. And they need to reward the right behaviors in public. They need to promote them and to make sure that, that they also look at the behaviors they don't want to promote and that they sanction them. So companies like Unilever, for example, are very clear on their purpose. Their mission statement is to add vitality to life. We meet everyday needs for nutrition, hygiene, and personal care with brands that help people feel good, look good, and get more out of life. And when you speak to people at Unilever, you get a strong sense of this, that employees feel that they're contributing to that purpose, and it's, it's no coincidence that they've just been voted employer of choice in 50 different countries. Now, anecdotally, and I would say this because this is, is FinCap, um, but certainly I, I know people that work at FinCap, and, and they speak the same way that people at Unilever speak. And I have to think that that comes from the culture that's set at the top. And looking at events like this, this is all part of the culture that, that I think people at FinCap feel. Um, another example, Southwest Airlines' mission statement is dedication to the highest quality of customer service delivered with a sense of warmth, friendliness, and a company spirit. 
We're committed to providing our employees a stable work environment with equal opportunity for learning and personal growth. And they're very clear in stating that they prioritize their employees first, followed by their customers and then their shareholders. So not every company can have such noble mission statements, but all firms can be clear on what they're trying to achieve. For example, some retail firms focus on delighting their customers or giving them the best customer experience. At HSBC, John Flint has tasked his staff with making it the healthiest human system, and he's actually letting them determine you know, what, what that is. And so whatever the purpose, everyone needs to know how they play a part in making it happen. As for a sense of belonging, the ethos comes from the top, but the implementation is at the team level. Think, for example, about joining a company and being warmly welcomed and introduced to everyone, having a buddy to help you navigate the new organization, and in more established teams, feeling like everyone's respected and everyone has equal opportunities for advancement and that team members all have each other's backs. Of course, none of this can happen without managers who take the time to get to know them and understand their team members and work with them to make them successful. Once again, I think newer companies, smaller companies, you've got the chance to build this from the beginning and to really make sure that, that these values are, are set within all the employees from the start. So just as there's no silver bullet to cure all diseases, there's no silver bullet to improve gender balance at all firms. However, I'm certainly going to rely on fitness, healthy eating, and positive mental attitude to help me fight my own cancer. And I'm going to keep advo advocating for companies to focus on inclusive culture and training for managers to help improve diversity and ultimately their performance. And so what I would ask of all of you is to make sure as you build your companies successfully that that's a really important part of how you think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Brenda, for joining us this morning.